The inspiration uh, for this book, uh, Remembering God's Mercy, uh, came from seeing the response to my previous book, which is uh, this one. I mean, this book is actually like book number like one and and three, <laughs> but this book is really book number book number two, um, which is uh, My Peace I Give You, Healing Sexual Wounds with the Help of the Saints. Uh, I wrote this book because I found that you know after several years of speaking on chastity, uh, I felt like um, I was only getting so far with sharing the message uh, because I hadn't, uh, in the original version of The Thrill of the Chase, before I rewrote it as the Catholic version, I hadn't really addressed uh, the woundedness that makes it so hard for many people, myself included, uh, to, uh, to live chastely. Um, it, because uh, for myself, uh, I, I suffered woundedness as a child, uh, ranging from, well, first, um, my parents splitting up. Uh, that alone is, divorce is recognized as a source of traumatic stress in children. Uh, and uh, after my parents split up, uh, I also suffered other kinds of woundedness, including uh, different kinds of abuse at home and also uh, childhood sexual abuse, which occurred first outside the home and then later on uh, inside the home, perpetrated by one of my mother's boyfriends. And, you know, to be quite honest, um, the uh, experiences that I had later on where I was, uh, as a teenager and young adult, seeking love in things that were not love, uh, these were really efforts to uh, fill uh, the... Uh, the hole within that was left by uh, having been treated uh, as an object as a child um, it, with the abuse and my uh, my uh, failing to uh, live chastely was also due to um, well, besides that I had never been taught about chastity it, it was really due to having this whole wanting affirmation you know uh, in adoration we uh, just heard that beautiful reflection about let Jesus love you. I, as a child, uh, having grown up Jewish, uh, didn't know about Jesus' love, and certainly if you had asked me when I was uh, a teenager, young adult, looking for love and things that were not love, if you had asked me was I looking for, for the love of God, I would have said no, uh, because uh, I believed that I was looking for the love of a person, and I didn't believe that God was a person, or I couldn't imagine God being a person. But now I know uh, that that these you know experiences during the time when I wasn't living chastely were really um, desiring the love of God. Now, you know, it doesn't take you know being uh, having been broken through uh, abuse or or divorce to be um, have that woundedness that makes you recognize uh, the need for God in your life, um, we're all wounded by original sin. And uh, no matter what our past, even if we've always uh, sought to live a holy life, uh, we all um, interiorly will run up against our uh, imperfections when we try to grow uh, in the spiritual life. Uh, for me, after I became a Christian uh, when I was 31, and especially uh, when I became Catholic uh, 10 years ago, I, I entered into full communion with the Catholic Church. Uh, what I uh, experienced uh, is that uh, Jesus, um, I experienced Jesus entering in and filling uh, the empty space uh, within. Now, in my case, I, Jesus entering and filling the empty space within extended even so far as to my uh, choosing to uh, make a uh, private consecration uh, of my celibacy to uh, the Sacred Heart through Mary's Immaculate Heart. But um, I, I would say that even if, even if I have found that I was called to marriage, I still would have needed Jesus to fill that empty space. What I learned, and this is actually what I share in The Thrill of the Chaste, as maybe you heard last year, is that God wishes to love 
me through other people, and God wishes to love other people through me. And that kind of love I can experience only through, through chastity. Uh, what I found, uh, as I write here, is that chastity is the virtue that enables us to love fully and completely in the manner that's appropriate to our state of life. So, so the type of love appropriate to the married state of life includes the love in the marital relationship, which includes the marital act. Um, it, it includes sexual uh, love within marriage. Um, but at the same time, for married people, chastity includes both the way they love each other, loving each other um, through a gift of self, through fidelity, but it also includes the way that they chastely love people who are not their spouse. Because married people, um, while they're only called to love their spouse through the complete gift of their sexuality, they're called to be spiritual parents, spiritual brothers and sisters to, uh, to everyone. And for me as a single woman, chastity doesn't include the marital act, but it does include that same spiritual motherhood, spiritual brotherhood and sisterhood, and also it includes really learning to, to love those who are related to me uh, by, by blood. Um, so uh, with my piece I give you, I sought to write for people directly addressing the wounds that I had recognized that impeded my own um, wishing to live chastely. And in my case, um, since uh, the biggest wound was childhood sexual abuse, I wrote for people who had suffered sexual abuse in childhood. Um, and this uh, was particularly um, directed towards those who, like me, had felt um, mis the wound of misplaced guilt. No child is ever responsible for the abuse that, that he or she suffers, uh, whether that abuse is perpetrated by a peer or by an adult. Uh, and for me, overcoming that wound of misplaced guilt was uh, made possible uh, largely through learning about saints who had suffered abuse, including sexual abuse, and had found healing uh, in Christ. So what happened was people who read this book approached me and they, uh, they said that this book really helped them. I mean, this book has sold more than 10,000 copies in four different languages. It's been translated into Spanish, Polish, Slovak. They said that there was woundedness in their families and among their friends beyond sexual abuse. And they wanted a book that they could just hand to anyone. Because with this book, if you hand it to someone, even though it's got a spirituality redemptive suffering, they may think, what are you saying? I've suffered sexual abuse. And then there's all the um, cultural prejudice against that. Um, so uh, in order that readers might have something that they could give to anyone who needs healing from any kind of wound, I wrote this, which is also a shorter book. It's a simpler book on healing of memories, and it's key to uh, the year of mercy. Because uh, one thing that Francis talks about often is that uh, what he sees clearly is that we, as a church, need to heal the wounds. Uh, Pope Francis has spoken about how he sees the church as a field hospital, where when you see someone you know, lying on the field of battle, you don't first ask him you know, what his temperature is, does he have a fever. You go to the wounds and heal them. And uh, Francis has been uh, very insightful in recognizing that many of our wounds are not um, just the wounds of sin, uh, although certainly the year of mercy is preeminently the time to seek mercy from God uh, for our sins uh, through the sacrament of confession. Um, but Francis uh, recognizes also that our wounds come from the wounds of uh, the pain of remembrance, either the pain of remembering our own sins or remembering the, uh, the dis disasters, traumas that have befallen us, um, illness, or the wounds of other people's sins committed uh, against us. Uh, in the preface of this book, I sort of set the tone for it. Uh, I do set the tone for it through an observation of John Henry Newman, which has been very healing uh, for me. Uh, it's from <coughs> his sermon on the mental sufferings of our Lord. 
And I, John Henry Newman is meditating on how um, in Mark chapter 15, uh, we're told that when Jesus was suffering on the cross, uh, the soldiers uh, offered him wine drugged with myrrh, uh, but he didn't take it. Why did Jesus refuse that drugged wine? Well, according to Newman, Newman says that Jesus didn't wish to limit his sufferings to the pain of the present moment. In other words, Jesus made a conscious choice to experience the pain of memory. And uh, what uh, Newman means by this is that uh, human beings experience pain primarily through the same mental faculty through which we remember. For animals, uh, animal pain is simply in the present moment. That doesn't mean that animal pain is is bad. I, I isn't bad. I mean, that doesn't mean it's that that we shouldn't you know try to prevent animal pain. But it does mean that animal pain isn't as bad as ours. Because if you think about it, you know, as bad as the pain from a needle comes or the pain from banging your I don't know if you call it the funny bone here, your funny bone. Uh, as painful as that is, if it just lasts for a moment, we can take it. We can take any kind of pain if it just lasts for a second, a split second, and it's gone. Uh, but what Newman points out is that, in fact, when we're receiving a shot or any kind of doctor's procedure, our pain doesn't begin with the shot. Our pain begins with seeing the doctor's hand coming up to us, thinking about the pain that we're going to receive, then beginning to feel the pain of the procedure, then wondering how long the procedure is going to be. And, 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 and then even after it's over, we have the, the memory of it. <coughs> That's different from animal pain. That's the kind of pain that only humans are capable of. Jesus came as man to, uh, to suffer and experience all the, the, the pains that had been caused by sin, and even just, um, just you know, simple physical pain that isn't explicitly caused by, by my sinning is still caused by the first sin that, that, that made a crack in the fabric of the world and separated uh, human beings from God in order to, <coughs> to reunite us, uh, to reconcile us with God. Jesus had to take on all his sufferings, so including the pain of memory. And uh, what I like about uh, Newman's insight about this is that it does more than help us understand who Jesus was. Uh, it helps us understand who he is. Um, we already know from the witness of the gospel that Jesus, having written, ha sorry, having risen, retains the physical wounds he suffered upon the cross. Uh, we see that in the divine mercy uh, image with the light streaming from the wound in Jesus' heart. Um, so what Newman's doing is he's following this to its logical implication. Jesus must then also retain his invisible wounds, the memories of each moment of his sufferings. Now you might ask then how can Jesus retain his his memories of pain, given that there are no tears in heaven? Well, the answer, I believe, is that just as in the resurrection, Jesus' visible wounds are now transfigured, radiating grace. Mm -hmm. We hear this in John 1.14, came full of grace and truth. Um, so too, Jesus' invisible wounds are now, likewise, glorified. All Jesus' sufferings remain etched in his memory, but his memories of them no longer bring him feelings of pain. In his risen state, when he remembers his passion, he remembers only his passion, the overpowering love that he bore that led him to shed every last drop of his precious blood for our salvation. So the question that I ask in this book is, it's, it's a rhetorical question. I, I think you, we would all answer yes to this. 
wouldn't it be wonderful to have the mind of Christ? To be able to look back at, at our entire life, both the joys and the sufferings, and to see only the love of God. Well, that's the question that I seek to answer here. And what I come up with is a kind of method for this healing of memory. And it's a method that's helped me. <coughs> I think we should be very careful of being um, one size fits all in terms of saying that any one method is like the perfect healing, you know, one, two, three, you're healed kind of uh, thing. Um, but I do think that there are certain methods that that um, work on principles that are sound principles. And the principles that I've sought to use uh, in this book, I believe are sound because they're principles that come from Pope Francis and and not just originating with him, but going back to uh, St. Ignatius Loyola, the Jesuit saints, and uh, even before that, St. Augustine, and even before that, St. Paul. And at the foundation of it is putting on the mind of Christ through seeking to uh, unite our memories to the memories of Jesus. Now, um, you know, Scientists, when they experiment, you know, if if there's a cure for something that kind of works but doesn't really work, they try to find a cure that works for more people. Um, as I said, one size doesn't, you know, doesn't fit all. But for me, uh, I had a therapist, a Catholic therapist, who tried to help me by telling me, well, actually what he said was, I can't help you unless you're willing to relive every painful memory and invite Jesus into every single painful memory. Now, I know people whom that has personally helped. Some people call it inner healing or theophostic prayer. Um, I know that that kind of prayer is often practiced by people who are um, in obedience to their uh, bishops. And I <laughs> praise anyone and everyone who is seeking to truly think with the church and be obedient with, to the church in helping people heal. For me, I was not able to be helped by that therapist's method because, you know, I think that that method of inviting Jesus in to one's memories and reliving every memory really only helps if you have one bad memory. If you only, like, in your life have one traumatic memory and all you need is to bring that memory to the light of Christ. But for people like me, you know, there's a problem because I have complex post-traumatic stress disorder. So, uh, so I didn't just, you know, experience one incident of abuse. I experienced it under different kinds. I also had the trauma of the divorce. These traumas, they, they go on and different, you know, different events will reawaken them and, and make, you know, the hurt go deeper. So in order to get, you know, really the deepest kind of healing, I couldn't do that reliving every memory because I'd be going back to, you know, the prayer group or the therapist or whatever every week, you know, you know, to come out feeling like, oh, yay, I'm on top of the world, I'm healed, and, you know, the next week, thinking, oh, maybe I wasn't so healed. But the reason I act this out, even though I didn't go through that, is because I've heard stories from many people who have just had that problem of getting addicted to the inner healing and never feeling like it's been resolved. So what I... What I saw in Francis and Ignatius and Augustine and St. Paul that I bring here is that the key is not to invite Jesus into the mysteries of my life. The key is to invite myself into the mysteries of Jesus' life. And then I can always be with him and always be hidden in his wounds. Uh, and certainly, you know, having prayer from other people, whether individually or in groups, helps. Uh, certainly the sacraments are essential. I found daily mass uh, and confessing regularly. For me, it's every two weeks or so. You know, those are, are tremendously helpful. Um, but, you know, ultimately with those sacramental foundations, uh, the key for me is seeking to live in a state of practicing the presence of, of, of Christ so that when I'm feeling, you know, any kind of pain, I think, well, when did Jesus feel this? Like when I was in, in Donegal, everywhere I went, um, I was being instructed by uh, this, um, this dear, well-meaning sister who was accompanying me 
make it simple, make it simple. These are simple people. They won't understand, you know, your, your you know, co college, you know, words, you know. Um, and, uh, and I was feeling, like, really uncomfortable because I thought, oh, this is terrible. I'm not really reaching these people. The truth is, I, I was reaching some of them, praise God. You can never reach everyone. Um, and then I thought, well, what mystery is this? And I realized it's Jesus leaving Nazareth and going outside of his comfort zone to, to preach to people. Yes, Jesus knew what he was going to say a lot better than I know what I'm going to say. He had, he, he had you know, perfect union with the Holy Spirit in a way that I don't experience, although I'm united with the Spirit in my baptism. Um, you know, he was in his nature. Um, but at the same time, Jesus uh, had it a lot more difficult than I did because he was... He had audiences that wanted to push him off a cliff. <laughs> I've never had that, thank God. But you know, going to you know experiences that that uh, some of you or some of your friends might have, um, which are experiences of of um, reliving traumatic stress. And I should tell you, most people who've experienced any kind of trauma will experience at least one symptom of traumatic stress. Only a minority will have full blown PTSD, which is a constellation of symptoms, but if you've had a traumatic ex episode, it is normal to have afterwards, even you know for the rest of your life, bouts of anxiety or loneliness or flashbacks or teariness or being easily startled. These are actually n normal, and it has biological roots in the different ways that the brain tries to protect itself in the wake of trauma. So. So for me now, when I experience those effects, I think of Jesus' <coughs> agony in the garden. I think of Jesus carrying his, his cross. And I know that when I, uh, when I seek to be with him and unite my suffering to his suffering, his passion, I'm united in a union of, of minds with him. And as I give him my memories, he's seeking to give me his. And his memories don't end like mine might with, you know, getting bogged down in the passion. Jesus is now risen, and his memory includes not just his passion and his death, but his experience in his risen state. And moreover, in his divine nature as God, Jesus is outside of time. And so, and so he sees his memory includes my future. Isn't that bizarre? <coughs> Jesus' memory includes my future. So if I give him my memory, then, then he is giving me his. Now, that doesn't mean I'm a prophet and can see what's going to happen, but it does mean that I can receive uh, the grace, the virtue, uh, the, the theological virtue of, of hope and deepen my trust in, 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 in Jesus' who knows the, the plan he has for me, as we hear in Jeremiah 29, plans to give me a future uh, and, a, and a hope. And so uh, I hope I've, I've given you some things to think about that will encourage you uh, as, as you seek to become um, more deeply hidden in the glorified wounds of Christ as we, as we, uh, as we pray in the Anima Christi when we say, uh, within thy wounds hide me. <laughs>